Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. I want to wake up, welcome you all to the African American Black History Program. It, we, we from the People's Organization for Progress and the Community Unity Leadership Council, we try to put this program on every year. And the purpose of putting this program on is to educate our community uh, in black history, uh, to keep it going, so to speak, to try to educate the kids. I wish the kids was here. I go to the schools and give the programs to the, to the teachers and the principals. The superintendent just left, too, by the way. But I tell them they got to bring the students out. Um, but we're going to move right along with the program. Um, I want to bring Deacon Ken Fay up to do the libation. You want to use the mic? Or you want to do it down there? You can, you can do it wherever you want to do it. Up here, down there. You need the mic? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah, right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm giving honor to God, who is ahead of my life, and all of the, um, of the um, noted uh, speakers that will um, be here today, um, Lawrence Hamm, Professor Griff, Keisha Hopkins, and of course, uh, Attorney uh, Alton Maddox, um, all of the other uh, dignitaries that are here, and all of you fine people who are here. Um, it's very, ha it's very uh, um, indeed a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm Deacon uh, Kenfe Mikhail. I'm um, a deacon at uh, St. Um, Michael's Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Um, our parish is in uh, Inglewood. I'm also um, chairman of the Black Forum of Passaic. And um, my task here this evening, um, which we will go through quickly because we have a very good program um, tonight for you, is to do a libation. Um, for those who may not be aware of, um, of libation, briefly I will explain. It's simply um, a uh, traditional African uh, ceremony to honor our ancestors, uh, those who have come before us in the history, some famous, some not famous, but um, the common thread is they all came before us, they all built the foundation that we stand on, and um, so we honor them, and we remember them always, because if we forget about them, then our link to the past has been broken. And if our link to the past has been broken, then our link to the future is damaged. So we remember our ancestors, and very briefly, we will mention just a few. The first one that I want to um, recognize, and um, we use uh, water because it is the, um, the basic foundation of life. Unfortunately, we don't have a plant. Um, so we're just going to try to be careful with how much we use. But the first name I want to mention, since we are here in the, um, it's beautiful, my hometown of Passaic, we remember one of um, our great um, Passaic ancestors, a gentleman who uh, has always been reached out to the young people of our community and always um, did programs for us and uh, established the Doing It in the Park years ago. And I'm so happy that the club is, um, has came up and has revitalized uh, that uh, wonderful institution. We remember a man, um, his name is Bobby Thomas. And as I pour out uh, a little bit of water to remember his memory, we respond by saying, Ashe, which means I share or I agree. So we remember Bobby Thomas, and we say Ashe. Also, we want to remember um, a man who has been described as a master activist. Uh, many of us um, aspire to be an activist or may call ourselves um, an activist, but it's a select few who have really put themselves out all the way for our people. And um, this is a man who um, just recently uh, passed, oh, thank you, who, um, who exemplifies that term, activist. We're going to remember Brother Kenneth. We call him Callum. 
Washington. We say Ashe. And um, it would be a crime if I did not mention a man who just recently left us. And it's very sad. Um, our hearts are still heavy trying to absorb the loss that has occurred. The recently elected mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, activist, lawyer, revolutionary, a man that must be um, remembered, and he is with the ancestors now, unfortunately, and the people of Jackson are going to have to carry on, and we are going to have to carry on, but we will always remember his work and his legacy. We remember Mayor Chukwe Lumumba, we say our shame. And um, the last, but certainly not least, we want to remember all of the unknown people, the ones who didn't make the nightly news, the ones that didn't get written in the newspaper, the ones that may not be written in the history books, but they were once here, and they did great things, and they helped us to become what we are today. And they may not be famous, but they did something. They made our people what, they, what we are now. We wouldn't be where we are if it wasn't for those unknown heroes and sheroes. So in your life, you can remember all of those people who helped you to become who you are in your life, whether it be a um, deceased uh, grandmother, grandfather, aunt, uncle, or any um, person who, who made you who you are. We, we honor them at this moment. And we will take a, um, a small, a very short um, moment of silence. Or if you want to, you can call out their name of the person who did, who, who made you, who you are, that you want to remember. So remember those unknown heroes and sheroes. And we say, Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Thank you very much. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the program. And while we're pouring libation, I want to um, I want to have a moment of silence for Jordan Davis, for Trayvon Martin, for Kenneth Count Washington, and for all the young brothers and sisters that are losing their lives to street violence. Thank you. Now I want to bring on, we're moving the program around a little bit because Reverend William Baskerville from Mount Moriah Baptist Church called me and said he got hung up at the school a little bit, uh, but God is still good. We have Reverend John Mazzone from 2 Timothy Baptist Church, 261 Main Avenue, Passaic. Could you come up and say, open us up in prayer, please? Pleasure to be here this evening. I thank God for allowing me to be a part of this event of the black history. And God, He is a wonderful God. We're going to bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I come to you this evening as humble as I know how. I come to see me, O oh God, for no show, form, or fashion, O oh God. But, O oh God, I come to give you praise, honor, and glory. Lord, first of all, I want to thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you, O oh God, for all of the many blessings that you have stored upon us, O oh God. O oh God, I come thanking you for you have brought us this far, O oh God. You said in your word you will never leave us. Neither will you forsake us, O oh God. 
And right now, oh God, I come thanking you, oh God. Lord, I ask that you will lead this, guide us in the way that you will have us to go, oh God. And oh God, I come thanking you, oh God, for this meal tonight, oh God. Letting us come together as one, oh God. Lord, I thank you because I know you're a God of all God. And there's no other God besides you, oh God. Lord, I come asking that you will bless everyone that are similar here. Bless everyone that are taking a part tonight, oh God. Lord, I ask that you will bless us name by name and one by one, oh God. Lord, I, I know you will never lead us, oh God, wrong, oh God. Lord, I ask that you will bless this whole entire event, oh God. Lord, I ask that you will bless the speaker, oh God. I ask that you will bless everyone that take part, oh God. Lord, I ask that you will let us be the one that you already are known as to be, oh God. Lord, I ask that you let us put nothing in our way, oh God. Let everything that you are known as, oh God, for us to do, let us be the, the one to go out and do it in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. I thank you because I know you've been so good to us, oh God. Lord, I know you brought us from a mighty long way. You, you brought us from the rocket of our creator up into this present moment, oh God. Lord, I give you praise, honor, and glory. Lord, I ask that you will bless the children, oh God. Lord, I ask that you will bless the one that brought us this far, oh God. Lord, I ask that you will bless us in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. And when I am going the last mile, and I, I can't go anymore, I'm asking for a home when then you can't travel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. We appreciate that. Now I want to bring on Reverend Tiffany McCutcheon from United Fellowship Tabernacle Church of Patterson to sing our National Black Anthem. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicings rise high as the glistening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing.
I want to just tell you briefly what the community unity leadership is about. We are a community sort of like a watchdog group. We go to the council meetings, we go to the board of education meetings, zoning, planning, housing, redevelopment. And we just try to just make sure that there's equality and fairness that's going on in these meetings, particularly with the African American community. I also want to mention or announce a young lady from the city of Passaic who's running for the Board of Education. Her name is Renee Griggs. Could you stand up and wave to the people, Renee Griggs? I, I think it's very important that we in our community get more active when it comes to these elections. We need to push our people up to leadership and in these positions so we, we can empower our community. We are being done so wrong here in the city of Passaic, and you all know what's going on here. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit further a little later, later on in the program. But I want to bring up another young lady, and her name is Sheila Montague, and she's from Newark. Sheila Montague is running for the West Ward Councilwoman for the seat of Councilwoman in the city of Newark. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. And I met this young lady. I'm sorry to have you stand here for a minute, but you're going to be all right. I met this young lady in, in the streets of Newark, being active. Me being a member of People's Organization for Progress, we champion so many people's cause. And this young lady fights very hard for the children of Newark. I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody else fighting as hard as this young lady fighting in the city of Newark for these children. And I know she's doing the same job for the whole community and certainly the West Ward of Newark. So without further ado, Sheila Montague. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jeffrey, for having me here tonight. I appreciate this invitation. Um, and right now, what I would like to do, um, I mean, I guess he pretty much said everything there is to say about me. Um, I just want to introduce to you one of the people who have been an inspiration and motivation in my life. Um, it's going to be before you now. Um, this is a person who gives, um, he puts the F in the word fight. As of recently, um, just on the topic of the Board of Education, is such an important position. And um, this particular person that I'm about to um, introduce, he has been um, instrumentally successful in moving legislation so that our schools in Newark can stop being closed. Please give it up for Senator Ron L. Rice. Good evening. Let me just say that, uh, first of all, let me apologize. I'm going to have to leave you shortly because I promised my wife, who's not that well, I'll stop and get her medicine and get her something to eat, too, so she didn't cook. But I also promised Jeffrey Dye I would show my face tonight because, unfortunately, I was invited to be your guest speaker uh, last year. And as Ms. Montague knows, Sheila, uh, we call it affectionately, I lost two brothers, one at the beginning of the year, one at the end, and that was in 2012. And then last year, every month, once a month, I was in Texas probating my brother's event, and it all happened. But Jeffrey Dye understood that, and so I, I could not, you know, let the day pass without driving up here, regardless of what I had to do, to say hello to you. I think that the work that Jeffrey and others have been doing up here is very important. And I do respect the fact that African Americans um, have a right to agree and disagree among ourselves as well, and sometimes that we're in conflicting roles. But I also want to remind you that there's a lot of work to be done. And I want to thank Sheila for introducing me. She's one of mine and one of ours in the city of Newark. She's my county committee district leader, and she is a candidate. But I think just about everybody who's been a part of me are candidates in my ward now. 
or at least at large. Like I thought she was at large. I didn't know she was running for the West, um, et cetera. But that's what you want. At the end of the day, the people that are good people, you want an office. At the end of the day, the people who are good people don't make an office. You want to continue to mentor them and grow them. And we have to make tough choices. I want to let you know that there's a lot of work to be done. What is occurring in this country in these modern times is really appalling and insulting to some of us who have come up during the era of the 1950s and 60s, the Civil Rights Movement. What's occurring here in the state of New Jersey is appalling. I think it's me quite a bit when I see that black folk are divided um, because of political bosses and power-structured people. There's a need for us to work with everybody of every ethnic group and in every, every culture and with those in the political arena. But when folk can just take pennies and dimes and job positions and buy our souls and suppress the, the history of struggle and suppress the progress that's been made, there's something wrong with that. And that's why you still have activists out here like Larry Harrell from Pop and others who have not forgotten that history. You have people like me, I'm the chairman of New Jersey Lace of Black Caucus. And I try to teach my new members that we're going to agree and disagree. But we need to stay focused on what our mission is and who and what we represent. These kids are dying of color, little brown boys and girls, little black babies, every day in the streets of these urban cities. And no one at the higher level of government seemed to care. They criticized us and said we can't run our institutions and we can't run our academic system, which is not true. What it is is there are movements to privatize everything in this country and in the state. That's the far right Christian wing and the hedge fund people and the wealthy folks, Republicans, you know, just trying to take over government, bust up unions where we work, where we need protections, etc. But in between, they always find someone that looked like us to be a part of. And we eventually have to start to call those folk out and hold them accountable. And let them know that you may be confused and you may not be confused, but you're a barrier to our progress. And because we love you, we don't want to hurt you. So get out in front of us and step on the side. Whatever you want to do, do on the side. We're not going to even try to stop you. But if you stay in front of us, we're going to walk over you. And so that's the message we have to start to carry. I want you to know that as the chairman of the Legislative Black Caucus, my commitment uh, to my members to do all I can to organize black elected officials, whether they like each other or not, from Salem County to Morris County and from Mars, for, to Bergen County, from Morris County to Hudson County. Because school board members and council members and black mayors and black freeholders and state elected officials should be coming into the, the same room at the same time and, and dealing with what we used to deal with, and that's policies. You see, what happened was for those younger people here in the younger generation, um, you weren't born during the time of the 1967 riots. Well, I came home from Cuba, I was in the Marine Corps, the night of the riots. You weren't out there in the early 60s and 50s. The older generation, my generation, understand this. We always had housing problems and poor people problems and job problems and health care problems. But we went into what was known as the church. That was our meeting place. But we didn't go in the church with just the minister. We went in the church with the black elected official, the clergy member. We didn't have that many black elected officials, but the ones we had went in that church with the pastor. But also with the pastor was not only black elected official, it was the civil rights leaders. And also in there were the black attorneys. And also in there were the labor leaders. Labor's always been a part of us. And there were others, and we sat there and said, it's a housing problem in Pacific, what are we gonna do about it? And we said, we don't know. Well, let's think about it. And someone would come for an idea, and someone said, that may work, but you gotta do this with it. And then we said, that may have to be put in there. And these was called policy meetings to resolve and try to find resolutions to our problems. Well, policies are something you work on a regular basis. You have to meet regularly to come up with policy and then to make it the right policy. And as a result of that, it was the policy that drove our politics. Someplace along the line, when we started the progress in the 70s, coming out of the disturbances, based on what was done at the federal level, um, the programs implemented, then we were doing okay. Some kind of way we got away from the meetings collectively and we got into politics. And I want you to know that politics is something that occurs once a year. You know, our lives are political, but elections are once a year. In between, we are doing nothing. And I can tell you this, 
you know, white America and black America that's, that's locked into them for whatever reason, and all those other folk are meeting in between the politics and they're putting together policies and plans to take back the progress that we've made over all these years. And so we can't blame anyone for this but ourselves. Do anybody, everybody here understand where I'm coming from? And so my job is to form these county alliances with black elected officials and to wait on no one and start calling people out. Assemblywoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, uh, my vice chair, she's going to get back to what we call the state alliance, which would include the black elected officials, but it also include labor leaders and nonprofit organizations and leaders such as the people you have here tonight and other organizations. So we can get back into planning our own destiny and taking control of our own destiny and start raising our families where we can have quality communities that we used to have, a good quality of life that is safe, and schools that function, that educate our, our kids, and we control our own destiny as a people. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to come up and talk to you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Truly appreciate it. Can we please give our senator another hand? <laughs> senator Rice led off with, he was supposed to, I wasn't going to mention it, but he led off with, he was supposed to have been here. He was one of our guest speakers last year, and he couldn't make it due to his mother's situation. And I think it's very important that I mention tonight that every speaker that I put on this program confirms with me and say that they're coming. I will never put a speaker on this program just for the sake of putting that speaker on the program. Professor Griff tells me he's stuck in Brooklyn in traffic. The traffic is really bad. Keisha Forrester tells me she's in the Holland Tunnel, stuck in traffic. And <clears throat> Alton Maddox tells me the same thing. He's stuck in traffic. So we're going to just move this program right along with the speakers that we have here. Um, I want to I reiterate again how important it is that we have these elected officials, how important his job is, uh, what he does for our community. Um, politics revolves around everything that we do in life. So it's important that we have our own people in place to represent us and who we can go to when we have certain issues that's occurring in our communities. Next person I'm going to bring on, who's going to do a little poem, and then she's going to lead into the next person that's going to speak, is a teacher at Lincoln Middle School, number four, and her name is Sheila Woodson. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, I'm just honored that um, Jeffrey asked me to uh, moderate this program. Um, honored because I'm born in Passaic. Honored because I went to the school system here in Passaic. My mom and dad were from Saluda, South Carolina. And honored that I'm able to give you a word right before this poem I want to do for you. As an educator for over 23 years in Passaic School District, taught history to middle school eighth graders. The one thing I'd like you to know as parents, grandparents, uh, guardians of children, that education is so important. It is the number one thing that we have to do with our kids. We have to make sure that their minds are educated. We have to teach them how to think and think critically. We have to teach them to be masters. We don't want them to be average and mediocre. Teach them to excel. Oftentimes, and I've seen this through the years, my own, even my own children, I have three, but many African American students throughout the years don't seem to achieve, want to be on the honor roll. That's corny, that's not cool. You know, what's wrong with, what's happened to a community where the kids feel that it's not What's the word I'm looking for? It's not popular to be smart. I can't speak white. What is speaking white? It's standard English. I mean, I learned to switch when I was growing up. 
You know, I could speak the way I spoke with my parents at home and in the streets. I spoke a certain way with my friends. I switched. And when I got my first job and I picked up that phone to answer, you know, whatever the, the company was, I knew how to switch and speak standard English. It's called switching. So I, I implore you. Please, please, please remember that education is so important. We must educate our children. Because the ancestors that stood and paved the way before them believed in education. That's why we have these black colleges and universities, because of them. Education is important. Now this poem is entitled, Look Into the Mirror. Uh, I am a poet, and I wrote this uh, years ago. Uh, right after Obama was elected. I was looking in the mirror, I was brushing my teeth, and all of a sudden I could see my ancestors behind me. And then as I saw my ancestors, ancestors behind me, I began to realize that the reason why, one of the reasons why we have a black president in the office is because of the ancestors. One of the reasons why I'm able to teach in the public school system is because of the ancestors. One of the reasons why we have the first black judge in Passaic Karen Brown is because of the ancestors. We're all here because of the ancestors. So the next time you look into the mirror, hopefully you're gonna see the ancestors. Look into the mirror and see the eyes of our ancestors red with the blood of our story from slavery to freedom. An oral tradition potent with words, the griots have spoken it. Haven't you heard? Today's poets have turned it into spoken word. Look into the mirror and see generations standing behind, creating an incredible human timeline from BC to AD from chains to change, from no rights to civil rights, to everything is gonna be all right, everything is gonna be all right, everything is gonna be all right. From the outhouse to the White House, from war to peace, from the South to the North, from separate to equal, we're all in this 21st century sequel. Images of Africans stand in the mirror, mouths shut up, petrified, stuffed with death-defying words. I will not die, I will survive. I will not die, I will survive. Bloody tattoos of struggle engraved across their backs. Eyes swelling in sweet triumph. The smell of victory is imminent. Hearts connected to the beat of a distant drum. Internal rhythm a spiritual rhythm, hearts beating, hearts singing, hearts beating, hearts singing. I Africa, kumbaya, Lord, let my people go. At last, a change is gonna come. Ain't no stopping us now. We're on the move. Electrifying sounds of blackness fill the air, creating new sounds of freedom, majesty, and fanfare. New songs of justice for us. New songs of justice. In the mirror, listen to this, behind us they stand. Our ancestors with broken spirit in hand, waiting for us to put them back together again. Waiting for us to ingest the body and digest the blood. Ancient sacrifice, rituals performed before and after the flood. Love filled bites, reflecting the beauty of his marvelous light. Take, eat, grow in strength. Remember their journey and never forget sacrifices made for the first African-American president. In the mirror, don't you see the ancestral bridge that carried us from sea to shining sea? This bridge brought us over. It carried us across. A sinuous connection of bones and flesh, soldered in God we trust. Gilded in the past sins of our fathers, the present travail of our mothers, birthed 
in the triumph of our new future. All those faces that stand behind us, stand up with us in this place at this moment in time. Finally, we all stand on this God's promised land in the mirror. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My people, I love you. I love you. <laughs> Next, I'm going to bring to you the attorney Kenyatta Stewart. Kenyatta Stewart joined Hunt, Hamlin, and Ridley as a staff attorney in 2008. And in 2012, he became the firm's first unnamed partner. He is the member, a member of the New York State Bar, and he is a native of Pat Patterson, and he is also a resident of Patterson, New Jersey. Kenyatta Stewart, attorney Kenyatta Stewart. Good evening, all. Good Again, good evening, all. Good evening. I appreciate it. I am definitely honored to be here today. Um, you know, I got the call not too long ago, a few days ago, that uh, they would be honoring Judge Brown. And I said, well, you know, with everything going on, somebody need to hear something else about her. So I, um, I took the opportunity to uh, be the person presenting the award to her because, you know, a lot of people don't know her, but um, Karen Brown is a mentor to me. Now, it's not every day you're able to present awards to one of your mentors, especially they don't even know about it. So, like I said, I am definitely honored. This is my second time here. I think I was here in 2012. I believe that was the year Mary Baraka was here. So again, I, I am definitely honored to be here. Um, you know, as they said earlier, I'm an attorney. Happens things, I just happen to be following behind Karen Brown. I am from Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, Karen's from Patterson, New Jersey. But more importantly, more importantly, uh, Karen Brown is not just a Patterson kid. She's a Patterson kid that went to John F. Kennedy. Um, happened to play some basketball. She, she claims she's pretty good at basketball. Good enough to play Division I basketball, Seton Hall. Now, she wasn't there because of her, I take that back, she might have been there for her athletic ability. However, she just happened to have a brain. She graduated from Seton Hall uh, Magna Cum Laude in criminal justice. She left there and went to Rutgers Law School. She took the thing that we call the bar exam and happened to be a lawyer to be able to be a practicing in New York and New Jersey. My point is, Karen Brown is a big deal. Now, many people know Karen Brown as being the uh, Passaic County uh, clerk, I think for two terms. One term? For five years, look at her. My, my point is, many people know her for being the Passaic County clerk, um, at least that's where many people was introduced to Karen Brown. Um, However, she decided to give up <clears throat> that form of, uh, you know, public work, and she began a different form. She is, um, surprisingly, one of the people who we know as Karen. However, she's also known as Judge Brown. You know, she uh, was, was it 2010? 2010 where she uh, was sworn in at Patterson. Imagine being able to be a kid from Patterson, New Jersey, and now you're a judge in Patterson, New Jersey. Now all the stories that we hear about, about you know my first time in court, because you have to understand, we all, as lawyers, we appreciate the fact that most people's first um, 
opportunity to be in a court is in a municipal court. That's the most busy, that's the busy place. Most cases go through the municipal court. And here Karen Brown became Judge Brown in her city. Well, that wasn't enough because the good people of Passaic, well, some good people, I guess, decided that they wanted Karen to come or Judge Brown to be Judge Brown of Passaic. But they had to top us a little bit. They made her the presiding judge. My point is, Karen Brown isn't just Karen Brown. She's Judge Brown. Now, I'll leave the comments for later on because I hope somebody has something to say about it. But I'm going to say this. And I've said it before. Passaic Court is a better court since Karen Brown has become a judge of Passaic Court. However, this isn't that topic because we're here to celebrate Karen Brown. See, remember, we're here to celebrate black history because there are black people making history. And I'm talking about Karen Brown. The best part about Karen Brown is this. While she may have a degree, criminal justice degree, she may be a lawyer in two different states, she may be a judge in two different cities, she's still humble, she's still a mentor, and quite frankly, still, still answer the phone for me when I have a question for her. My point is, Karen Brown isn't just a county clerk. She isn't just a lawyer. She isn't just a judge. She's a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome up Karen Brown. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that wonderful introduction, uh, Kenyatta. I always tell him, I, I want to be like him when I grow up. He's an awesome uh, role model, he's an awesome man, he's a great attorney, and he's a wonderful friend, so thank you for that great introduction. Uh, I told, Jeffrey Dye called me, probably at the same time he called Kenyatta, and told me that he was going to honor me tonight. He knows I don't like surprises. And I told Jeffrey Dye that he did not need to do this because his efforts for the last two months has been phenomenal and that is more than I could imagine. And he has honored me in that way. So I appreciate his tireless efforts <laughs> and advocacy. I want to thank the uh, People's Organization for Progress, uh, the Community Leadership Council, Community, Community Unity Leadership Council, uh, and Lawrence Ham. Uh, they have also been in my corner. I got a chance to connect with one of my mentors, uh, Ms. Ingrid Hill, and I'm going to get to her in a little bit in more detail. Uh, I, I truly want to thank each and every person who have expressed their unwavering support for me for these last two months. Uh, I want to give a special recognition to the Brothers Organization of Patterson, uh, Team Charity, and Hassan Dixon, the members of the Muscle Team, uh, Calvin Merritt, the president of the Passaic NAACP, thank you. Uh, Reverend Calvin McKinney, who's not here, but he did appear at the very first meeting when they introduced the uh, ordinance. Uh, of course, uh, Ingrid Hill and Kenyatta Stewart. There are so many other individuals that I would like to thank personally. I can't name each and every one of them. If I did, we would be here all night, but I do want to uh, thank you. I want you to know that from the bottom of, of my heart, I am uh, deeply touched beyond measure and truly humbled by your expressions of support, encouragement, and guidance. And I really can't put into words. Words cannot truly express how grateful I am. I never set out to do what I do for any type of, uh, of recognition. It does mean a lot to me to be recognized by my community. I've dedicated my entire career to public service, and I would not have it any other way. Uh, my goal was to get a good education 
so that I could break the cycle of poverty in my family. And not only that, but to come back and to give back to the community and serve as a role model to young men and women with backgrounds that were similar to mine. I went to law school because I wanted to become an attorney, not to make a whole lot of money, but so that I could empower and give a voice to the powerless. I grew up uh, in Patterson and I didn't grow up with a very privileged uh, background. But I have to tell you, it was because of people like Ingrid Hill, Hill who was part of, I think you were deputy director of the educational? Associate. Associate director. I came in as a student of the EOP program, the Educational Opportunity Program. Yes, Kenyatta, I played basketball, but I was a walk-on. I was there for academics. I had a bunch of scholarships, including the EOF scholarship, and I walked on to the basketball team. Um, but uh, Ingrid Hill was one of the individuals that really changed my life because I come from a so-called poor, uh, disadvantaged, and underprivileged background. I was on a campus full of other students who were advantaged and who were privileged. But Ingrid Hill made all of us feel as though we could compete with on this, and on the same level as those individuals who were privileged and who were advantaged. So I learned to just strive to be the very best within whatever I did. And I felt that by being the best at what I did that ultimately it will be rewarded and ultimately I could serve my community in the best capacity that I could. I strive to do my very best in the face of many, many obstacles or as Ms. Ingrid Hill would say, I had a lot of baggage. But I strive to do my best despite the fact that I was the first person in my family to ever go to college, despite the fact that my mother had me at 15 years old, despite the fact that both of my parents never graduated from high school, despite the fact that my father was addicted to drugs and in and out of jail for most of my life, despite the fact that my mother was diagnosed with, mentally Ill, with mental illness and probably reads on a second grade level, despite the fact that I went to bed hungry most nights because we didn't have food in the house. So when I stepped on the campus of Seton Hall University, I was a frightened and insecure little girl with big hopes and dreams. My senior year of high school, I was given the black history makers of the McDonald's. I was a finalist in the, black, the McDonald's Black History Makers of Tomorrow contest. Uh, I never, beyond my wildest dreams, thought that I would actually be making history in my very own county. I became the, not to toot my own horn, but I became uh, the first African-American assistant county council. Uh, I became the first African-American to ever hold a constitutional office in the state of, in the county of Passaic when I became county clerk. <laughs> I became the first African-American county clerk in the state of New Jersey and the first African-American uh, judge to be appointed in the city of Passaic. And I don't say that to toot my own horn. I say that so that individuals who can understand, especially young people, that it doesn't matter what, where you come from. It doesn't matter what your parents are or are not. If you work hard and you persevere, you can achieve whatever you want to achieve. Today, the first day, uh, just like Kenyatta said, um, it's such an honor to be a judge in the city where you grew up. Uh, my desire to go to law school started in the very courtroom where I sit twice a week in Patterson. When I was a freshman in high school, uh, they raided my house while, while I was at a drama competition. My father at the time was not just using drugs, but he was selling drugs to support his habit. And on a Saturday morning, when I was out at a drama competition, they decided to raid my house. So they arrested my entire family. They arrested my my father, they arrested my mother, they arrested my younger brother and sent him to the youth house. 
And so when I came home, I came home to an empty house. I found out from my neighbors what happened. But during that process, I can just recall my mother, uh, me staying home at 14 years old by myself. Somebody ended up calling Dyfus, but that's a whole other story. I remember my mom calling the house and crying because she didn't understand what was going on. She was really not responsible. So throughout that whole process, to make a long story short, she ended up pleading guilty to a crime that really should not have, she should not have been responsible for. So she ended up getting a criminal record partly because she was poor, partly because she really couldn't read and write and did not understand the system and could not afford to pay an attorney. So I recall being in that court, seeing my father get arraigned in an orange jumpsuit with Passaic County Jail on the back. So the first time I took the bench in that courtroom, I remembered that. And so it was just, um, you know, words again could not explain how I felt, but I felt a sense of accomplishment and felt that I, I you know, I accomplished things beyond what I thought that I could uh, accomplish. When I was appointed uh, by the city of Passaic as a municipal court judge, my goal was simply to ensure that everyone that appeared in that court was treated with courtesy, dignity, and respect, and to do individual justice and indi in individual cases, to apply the law faithfully and fairly, and to temper each decision with patience and compassion and ensure that everyone was afforded due process under the law. As Kenyatta Stewart indicated, you know, the municipal court is the face of the judiciary. It is through the municipal courts that most citizens in the state come into contact with the judicial system, since most individuals will never appear before any other courts. It is from their experience in the municipal court system that form the basis of their perception about the equality of justice in New Jersey. So I took and I continue to take this responsibility very seriously. More than three decades ago, uh, Chief Justice Vanderbilt stated, the wearing of a judicial robe is important in part because it reminds all concerned of the fact that the judge represents the law on which liberty depends. The robe is even more significant as a constant reminder to the judge that he does not have the freedom of the ordinary individual, but is himself bound to submerge his personal feelings and the uh, impartial administration of the law. The judicial robe is a constant reminder to the magistrates that, that they, like other judges, are, subjects, are subject to the canons of judicial ethics as rules of court. It is not enough that a judge be honest and impartial. It is essential that he had the reputation in his community for being a man of absolute integrity, whose judgment is not and cannot be influenced by other than the proofs introduced before him in court. No matter what the vote is on Tuesday, March 4th, I am, a, I am confident that I have accomplished the goals that I set out to accomplish, and based on all of the support that you have shown me these past two months, I believe that I can say that I have demonstrated to the community that I am a person of integrity. So for that, I will hold my head up high. And thanks to, you, to all of you, all of you in this room, all of you, all of the individuals who are not here, you have turned a situation that could really have been demoralizing, you've turned it into a situation of triumph, empowerment, and inspiration. Thank you and God bless. If they won't honor our honorable judge, we will. <laughs> On
we have, before I do that, let me read this out first. On behalf of the People's Organization for Progress, the Community Unity Leadership Council, the United African Movement, the Brothers Organization, Team Charity, and the Passaic Chapter of the NACP, we present the Honorable Judge Karen Brown for your outstanding contributions to the community and unwavering commitment to the principles of justice and equality for all of us. Thank you. God bless you. Each and every one of those organizations participated in the flowers that more, more importantly, they participated in the fight. They've been at every single council meeting. And we started on January the 7th, uh, came back on the 14th. Uh, the 21st was canceled, came back on the 14th, came back on, I'm forgetting, on the 18th. And then we got to go back in there March 4th, which is Women's History Month. Thank you all. I know Kenyatta Stewart um, gave, a, gave the history of the judge, um, and I couldn't do as much honor as he did. But, but I want to say something very briefly. When I first met Judge Karen Brown, I had started my nonprofit organization, North Jersey Local Residents Workforce, a job training placement program. And I went to legal aid to get my 501c3. And she was there. She helped me to get my 501c3. She encouraged me to go and do this program in the community. So she meant a lot to me. That was the start. And then when she became county clerk, she ran for county clerk and won. We, we had been just watching John Curry bully the candidates on a regular basis. You know, he would put a candidate in place and then he controls them and tells them what to do. But Judge Karen Brown wasn't like a regular candidate. When she won the county clerk's position, John Curry came in, the bully that he is, and told her, we're going to staff your office with this deputy clerk, and this person is going to be in your office. And she said, no such thing is going to happen. She won that election, and she picked her own staff. So that right there showed me the courage that she had and the, the, the equality and the fairness that she had. And it just made me want to champion her cause from that point on to see somebody stand up to John Curry. That's unheard of. No candidate, the congressman, none of them don't stand up to him. But she did. So I'm, I'm asking you to spread the word. Tuesday, March 4th, 6.45 PM, please come into Passaic City Council Chambers to stand up for somebody who has stood up for all of your family members in this community, from here to Patterson. We must start to network with, we, with each other. Whether you live in Newark, whether you live in Patterson, wherever you live at. If a candidate is running in Patterson, we need to get on Facebook, get on our, our, our whatever means of communication that you use, and start supporting those candidates. You don't have to be over there running behind them. Get on Facebook. When you see their name come up and what they're doing and what they've been doing in the community, we need to get behind these candidates. Ms. Renee Griggs from Aspen Place Projects been fighting for years in their projects for those kids, for, that, for those families. People getting put out, she getting them put back in. She's running for the Board of Education. We need to get behind her 1,000%.
and, and not just talking about it. Everybody know me. If I get behind you, I'm running in the streets, I'm knocking on doors, I'm doing whatever you need me to do. Because I know how important it is to have somebody in leadership, in elected position, to represent us. You, you're not going to realize how important Judge Brown is to us um, when she's gone. You, you don't miss your water until the well runs dry. Right. But when you start going before Judge Irwin, I'm going to try to be nice. I'm going to try to be nice. <laughs> Judge Rodriguez, when you go before them, who I've been before both of them. <laughs> and it's off to the county jail with you. Back to slavery. So it is what it is. You're, you got to appreciate what you have while you have them in your midst. Um, okay, I see, um, I still ain't heard from my other speakers. So I'm going to bring Sheila back on to bring on our, our keynote speaker. <laughs> Thank you all. I think it's time for us to uh, let Jeffrey Dye know just how much we appreciate him as well for putting this together. This is for you, Jeffrey. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Dye, Mr. Dye. He's conferencing. We love you, Jeffrey Dye. You missed it. We just gave you a cookie. You know, everybody stood up and said thank you. We're saying thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. And also, once again, congratulations, Judge Karen Brown. <laughs> this next person is a powerhouse. I heard him speak last year and years uh, years before. Lawrence Larry Hamm, what can I say? <laughs> you never get tired of hearing this individual. He's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to black history and also in terms of being a political activist. He's inspiring, he's motivating, um, he's a master. And um, I was gonna read all of this stuff to you, but you know what? Um, you don't need it. You're right. <laughs> I'm just going to bring him on up. Come on up. Larry Ham. Power to the people. Say it loud. We're going to change it up. It's Black History Month, so we say it loud. I'm. Black I'm proud. Say it loud. I'm black I'm proud. Say it again. I'm black I'm proud. Brothers and sisters, I'm very glad to be here this evening. Before I say anything else, I would ask that on this, the last day of Black History Month, we pay a special tribute to three of our great heroes who have gone before. Last Friday night was the anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Many of us call ourselves black today because of Brother Malcolm X. In January, we lost one of our own homegrown, stomped down revolutionaries, Brother Amiri Baraka. And Several weeks before that, we lost an international hero, the leader of the anti-apartheid movement, 
who brought down the anti-apartheid government of South Africa, and after serving 27 years in jail, walked out of jail and literally into the presidency of that country, and that was Nelson Mandela. So I ask if you would join me and let us stand and have a moment of silence for Malcolm X, for Amiri Baraka, and for Nelson Mandela. And if you are so inclined, I'm going to raise my fist in memory and in a salute to those freedom fighters. Long live Malcolm X. Long live Amiri Baraka. Long live Nelson Mandela. Power to the people. I have to say, honestly, that I stand before you in a state that few people would believe if you told them Larry Ham was speechless. <laughs> but after hearing the testimony, were y'all listening? After hearing the testimony of Karen Brown, Judge Karen Brown, what a testimony. When we, when we talk about the triumph of the human spirit and the ability to overcome adversity. I've heard many stories, but few could compare to Judge Brown's testimony. And as I was listening to Judge Brown, it was the words of Frederick Douglass that came to mind. Frederick Douglass once said, it is not the heights that a man attains that is important. It is the depths from which he comes. Karen Brown, if she had a normal life <laughs> and became a judge, that would be a great accomplishment. But to rise up out of the muck and the mire and overcome obstacles that would have destroyed many of us is a testimony to the strength of her character and the fortitude of her spirit. And in Judge Brown, we see a microcosm of the African American people. In Judge Brown, we see the essence of the African American people. We are a great people. We are a great people. And I tell you tonight, despite all that is negative that we may see in Newark and in Camden and in Patterson and Passaic and Detroit and Chicago, Los Angeles and Atlanta, all of us lament the rates of homicide that exist in the black community, the ravages of drugs in our community, the number of our people that are in the jails throughout this nation. Despite all of that, I am proud to be a black man in America.
I am proud to be a descendant of people who were enslaved in this country. And nothing that they can say, nothing that they can repeat over the television and over the radio a thousand and one times, I don't care how many negative stories they have, I am proud to be a descendant of those who overcame enslavement of 500 years, who overcame re-enslavement called Jim Crow segregation. And as we overcame our enslavement, and as we overcame Jim Crow, we will overcome the adverse conditions that affect our people today. I am confident of that. I am confident of that. What we have experienced in this country would have destroyed many other people. Few people could have gone through what we went through, brothers and sisters. And I know tonight is a celebration, but I feel during Black History Month, we have to say something about how we got here today. <laughs> if there's no other time of year for us to recount what happened to our people, we should definitely recount what happened to our people during this time. A word about Black History Month, and I know everybody in here, because I know I'm speaking to all the soldiers, those of you who came out on one of the coldest days of the year, you're the soldiers of the movement. And I realize that you're the veterans. And I want to thank you for all your efforts this past year since I was last in this room with you. I know you have been fighting and fighting hard for Judge Brown and for other causes. But why do we celebrate Black History Month in February? How many people know the name Carter G. Woodson? Carter G. Woodson, if you haven't read his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, I ask that you all do. In fact, y'all need to go down to the next Board of Education meeting and ask them to put that on the reading list for social studies courses, The Miseducation of the Negro. <laughs> Carter G. Woodson was the second African American to receive a PhD from Harvard University. And imagine this, he received his PhD from Harvard in 1912. Now why is 1912 significant? Because it was during the late 19th century and the early 20th century that we saw the height of lynching in America. That was the height of the period of lynching. Now lynching never stopped. It continues to this day. But the literal lynching of black men, hanging them from trees, castrating them, and so forth, and tearing their bodies apart and burning them, that was at its height. And Carter Woodson was at Harvard. It's hard for a black student at Harvard University today. What must it have been like for Carter Woodson at the turn of the century at Harvard University. And I know that many of you would like your children to go to Harvard University, or maybe go to Princeton University like I did, or maybe go to Yale University. But there's one thing, brothers and sisters, that we must remember about these fine institutions of higher learning, that they were built with slave labor. And this must never be forgotten. They were built with slave labor. There's a new book out called Ebony and Ivy. And you all should get that book and read that book 
And I'm not saying that to discourage young people from going to these universities. I went to those universities too. But you need to know where you're going. And you need to know the history of these places. And these places, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Brown, and others, were built with the wealth garnered directly from the slave trade and then secondarily from the industries that use slave labor. So Carter Woodson was at Harvard University in 1912, got his PhD. He was the second, the first was W.E.B. Du Bois. Dr. Du Bois' birthday was last Sunday, February 23rd. There are a lot of important dates. I mean, there's something every day of Black History Month. February 1st, 1960, the birthday of Langston Hughes. February 1st, 1964, students from North Carolina A&T sitting at a Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and start the sit-in movement. February 11th, Nelson and Mandela is released from prison after 27 years. February 12th, 1909, the NAACP is founded. February 21st, the assassination of Malcolm X, and I can go on and on and on. Carter Woodson came back home. He could have just stayed in the Ivy Tower, but he wanted to share with his community what he learned about black history. Because remember what they were saying at that time, brothers and sisters, that we were people that didn't have a history. This is why we have Black History Month, because of the mythology that we were people. That, in fact, the truth of the matter is that they not only thought that we were not a people that had a history, they didn't think we were human beings, period. You know, from the beginning, they knew that the slave trade was wrong. Bartholomew de las Casas was in debates in Europe. Initially, de las Casas argued that they shouldn't enslave the indigenous people. You know, that's who they first enslaved. You know when the beginning of slavery was? When Christopher Columbus lands in the Caribbean. That's the beginning of slavery. First slaves taken in the Western Hemisphere by Columbus. The Arawak, the Carib, the Taino, the Boricua, these were some of the indigenous peoples and these were some of the people he enslaved on the first voyage. The first one, not the fifth one, the first one. They took slaves and our children. This is the irony of it. Black and brown children probably sit in Martin Luther King's school on, in October. They cut out little Nina's little Pintas and little Santa Marias. The teacher leads them in singing, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1492, for many weeks he was at sea, sailing ships at number three. Those ships were slave ships. They took slaves, and the descendants of slaves celebrate the birth, the, the, the advent, the arrival of the man that begins the slave trade. It should not be a holiday. It should be a morning for Native American people and African people. It should be a day of mourning. For 250 years, they enslaved the indigenous, but the indigenous could get away, so they turned to the African. Bartholomew de las Casas, he argued, he said, we should not enslave the indigenous people because they have souls. But what did Las Casas say? He said, we can enslave the African because they have no souls. This was the beginning, from the beginning. And Columbus, where did he learn the art of navigation? He learns it in the slave trade with the Portuguese up and down what they call the Guinea coast, the west coast of Africa. That's where he learns the art of navigation. Slavery of Africans was already in effect before he got to the Western Hemisphere. There were at least 60,000 Africans enslaved on plantations along the Mediterranean. They were going to put into effect in the Western Hemisphere a system that they had already developed 
in Europe and in the Mediterranean. And then Columbus and his family and his sons, they're given land in Cuba. You should read Eric Williams' book, From Columbus to Castro, and read Dr. Eric Williams' book, From Capitalism to Slavery, to get the real deal on Columbus, this Columbus that is celebrated. Columbus told the indigenous people that they must bring to him a thimble full of gold every day. Because you literally could go to the river and pan gold and bring gold. And he said, those who do not bring me my thimble full of gold every day, I will cut off your fingers and your hands. And that's what they did. And whole populations of indigenous people were wiped out in the Caribbean. I mean, where we stand today, imagine that. Indigenous people used to live. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that this is the Native Americans' land. <laughs> this is still their land. And this country, I mean, we talk about the violence, right? How come there's so much violence in America? Well, as Rap Brown said, violence is as American as apple pie. <laughs> this country was founded on violence stands knee deep in rivers of blood. The extermination of the indigenous people, the enslavement of the African. Do you know what Dr. Du Bois's doctoral dissertation was? His doctoral dissertation topic was the suppression of the West African slave trade. And that became a book that he wrote. Du Bois says in the suppression of the West African slave trade that they took a hundred million Africans out of Africa. But only about 10 million made it. Most died in the Middle Passage. Eric Williams says in Capitalism and Slavery that the slave on the slave ship had less space than a dead man in a coffin. They had a science to it. They call it loose pack and tight pack. Loose pack was they'd leave him a little room to move around. The problem was that the, the, the object of the slave trade was to make money. Profit was the driving motive. So if we leave them enough space to move around, that means that we're not going to have enough people to make enough money when we get to the other side. So they had tight pack. And you see the vivisection of that ship, right, in some of the books where you see the slaves. I mean, you, I guess a lot of people, well, well, why does it look like that? It's a picture of them laying in the bowels of the ship. Three months the voyage, they lay in their own vomit and their own excrement. Many went mad from the condition. Women threw their children overboard rather than let them be born into slavery and threw themselves overboard. There are scientists who speculate that there was an increase in the shark populations along the eastern shores of the United States because of the number of dead slaves that went into the Atlantic. They even got right scientific about it, you know? Like, the British abolished the trade before the United States. And just as the Civil War, and this is a, a lecture for another time, just as the Civil War was about slavery, the War for Independence was very much about slavery too. The British abolished the slave trade first. So the British used to seize the slave ships of the Americans. So they would build ships, right, that had trap doors. So if they were stopped by a British naval vessel, they would open the trap doors and literally let the Africans that they had in jail fall into the sea. And you know what happened when we got here. We were branded like animals. Our families were torn apart. Our language and our culture was outlawed. We were given names that were not our own. My wife went to a family reunion about 10 years ago. And she got the historical documents of her family all the way back to slavery. And the county records would have a column and the column would have names. And the names didn't have no last name, just the first name. 
Those were the slave names. Some of them didn't, didn't even have names. They had man, boy, girl. But some had first names. They had no last name. Why? Because the last name was the slave master's name. Our families torn apart. Our language outlawed. Our names taken away. Nobody can imagine the horrors of slavery the instruments and the implements. Whole towns in England grew up on the manufacture of things that were used in the slave trade, like the manufacture of chains, the manufacture of the iron belts that went around the kegs of rum that slaves were traded for. Whole cities grew up around. Birmingham, England. Whole businesses grew up around this. Lloyd's of London. How many of you heard of Lloyd's of London? It's an insurance company. It started, not secondarily, it started as a company to insure slave ships. And slavery was big business, brothers and sisters. In 1860, the greatest form of capital in America, greater than banking capital and industrial capital combined, was the wealth invested in slaves and the slave trade. So people say, America is a great country. It's the richest and most powerful country in the world today. It's rich and powerful because it stole the labor of our great-grandparents, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, our ancestors. It stole their labor. And if anybody should get reparations, the descendants of African people in this country deserve and would be justly compensated with reparations. People say, we walk around here now. And especially the educated black people. That's what gets me the most. The educated the black people that got the most, got two and three degrees, got, took black history courses. I don't understand that you took black history. You know what? Right? The white man don't owe me nothing. He owes you everything. He owes you everything. The white man don't owe me nothing. Let me tell you something. For 500 years, people prayed for an end to slavery. They agitated for an end to slavery. They wrote for an end to slavery. They held conventions for an end to slavery. But ultimately, brothers and sisters, it took a war, a civil war, the biggest war this country has ever fought. More Americans, nearly a million, died in the Civil War more than World Wars I, II, Korea, and Vietnam, and Iraq, and Afghanistan combined. 750,000 soldiers alone. This is what it took to break the backbone of the slave system in this country. I was speaking at a program the other night. My sister introduced me. While she was introducing me, she was giving a little black history lesson, and she did pretty good. So she said, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation and it freed the slaves. <laughs> now that's the popular mythology. The fact of the matter is the Emancipation Proclamation was a military recruitment document. The North was not winning the war because the North was divided against itself. There was as much racism in the North as there was in the South. In fact, y'all always talking about the South. There was as much slavery in the North as there was in the South. And don't go looking for Alabama and Georgia. Look right here in New Jersey. There was slavery right here in New Jersey. There were 12,500 registered slaves in New Jersey. 
at the time of 1860, the beginning of the Civil War. You know what the most active slave port was? It wasn't Charleston, South Carolina, it was New York City. Wall Street, Wall Street is where the auction block was. That's why it's the financial center because that's the origin of the finances. That's where the auction block was, on Wall Street. The most active slave port, the most active slave port on the East Coast was New York City. What was the most active slave port after that? Perth Amboy, New Jersey. What was the most active slave port after that? Camden, New Jersey. Why was that? Lincoln didn't win New Jersey in 1860, he didn't win it in 1864. And when Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, the state legislature of New Jersey nullifies Lincoln's power to emancipate slaves in this state. When the Civil War was over and they passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which abolished chattel slavery, which made us citizens, and which gave black men, not black women, black men the right to vote. Women did not get the right to vote until the second decade of the 20th century. It took a three-fourths vote of the states to pass these amendments. There were 36 states, so you needed 24 states to ratify each of those amendments. New Jersey was not in the three-fourths majority on the 13th Amendment, on the 14th Amendment, or the 15th Amendment. This state was very much in sympathy with the South because there was what was called a political economic relationship, political economy. Political economy is the science of the relationship, how one hand of politics washes the other hand of economics. The South sent the raw goods from uh, their area up to New Jersey. Factories in New Jersey and shops in New Jersey changed these raw goods into products and sent them back down south. So each side was making money. So the North was divided. It was divided against itself. The first Supreme Commander of the Union forces was McClellan. He wouldn't even fight. Lincoln kept sending him telegrams. McClellan wouldn't fight because he was a Southern sympathizer. They didn't want to kill their brothers from Georgia and their brothers from the Carolinas and their brothers from, they didn't want to kill them. So Lincoln fired McClellan. McClellan comes to New Jersey and is elected governor. And McClellan House is in Montclair, a national monument. So Lincoln replaces McClellan with Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant hires a fella that is probably the most hated man in the South today, William Tecumseh Sherman. And Sherman, says that I'm going to teach them the meaning of rebellion. When Sherman gets to South Carolina, he confiscates 30,000 acres of the slave master's land. What does it mean, confiscate? That means he took their land. He took it with a stroke of a pen. He issues general order number 15. It was a military order saying this land was owned by people who were in rebellion against the government of the United States. Therefore, I, Tecumseh Sherman, do hereby confiscate 30,000 acres and I give it to the freedmen who worked that land for all these years. That's their land. That's what Tecumseh Sherman did. And based on general order number 15, Thaddeus Stevens in Congress, y'all remember Thaddeus Stevens? Yes. See, it's important, brothers and sisters, that we know the role of whites who supported our struggle. There were many whites who opposed it, but there were some that supported it. There were people like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner who were called the Radical Republicans. And in their band was Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. And it was the Radical Republicans Douglas, Harry Tubman, 
Charles Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens, that went to Lincoln and said, look, look, Lincoln, you're not winning this war. You got to get some people in the fight who have a real interest in winning. And Lincoln says, who might that be? He says, they say, you need to put arms in the hands of the slaves so that they can fight. Lincoln thinks about it. I should give rifles to the people <laughs> that we are holding as slaves. Which way they gonna point them guns? <laughs> but driven by necessity, Lincoln gives in. And 220,000 black men and women. See, it's important when you go deep into our history, brothers and sisters, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion. You know how onion is? You cut it and you see all these concentric rings. History is like that. You got to drill down deep. And when you drill down deep, you know what you do? You destroy lies and falsehood and obfuscation and you recover memory. You know what the greatest weapon of oppression is? The greatest weapon of oppression is not the gun. It's not the chain. It's not bullets. It's not whips. It's not bomb. You know what the greatest weapon of oppression is? to erase a people's collective memory. Because when they erase your collective memory, you have no idea what they did to you. And they can sell you anything, tell you anything. Your mind becomes like a blank slate. You know the Latin term tabula rasa, mean blank slate. And they write what they want you to think on that blank, blank slate. That is why it is imperative that we teach our children our history, not just in the classroom, but in our living rooms and in our kitchens and in our dining rooms and in our churches and in our lodges and on the street corners and even in the bars. If we have to go into the bars, we got to teach our history because it is our history that gives our per people identity, purpose, and direction. So they arm, Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation on September 22nd, 1862. Becomes effective on January 1st, 1863. December 31st, 1862, black people go to church and they have watch night service. Now I know they don't talk about this during watch night service today because I know they have watch night service. But the origins of watch night service is when our people in December of 1862 went to watch and pray to see if the Emancipation Proclamation would be put into effect. So 220,000 black men answered the call. 186,000 joined the Union Army. The others joined the other divisions of the armed forces. Harriet Tubman becomes the only woman at that time to receive the official title of general. Did you know that? She was General Harriet Tubman. You know, we only talk about the part where Harriet Tubman goes back, you know, and one by one, three by three, five by five, rescues our people, makes some like 30 trips to the south and rescues our people. But do you know what else Harry Tubman did? She was a reconnaissance officer for the Union forces. She, she showed the secret places where the Confederacy used to hide and she would lead the Union forces there so that they could destroy them and capture them. She was so successful at this that this little black woman became General Harriet Tubman and we should honor her the way she needs to be honored today. But here's the irony, brothers and sisters. Here's the rub. Even though they were fighting in the same army, the black troops and the white troops couldn't fight together. They, the black troops were in units called the colored troops. And when they died, they couldn't be buried together. Today, there's a little town you need to go to. 
How many of you have heard of Pennington, New Jersey? Pennington, New Jersey is a little town between Princeton and Trenton. And the people of Pennington have a cemetery there. You know what the cemetery is called? It's called the African Cemetery. And the People's Organization for Progress, we know about the African Cemetery because we've been there many times. The black people of Pennington in the 19th century because the black soldiers could not be buried in the same cemeteries with the white Union soldiers, bought land, and they called that land the African Cemetery. And nobody is buried in there except the black Union soldiers. And on their headstones, they left for posterity. They wanted you to know what they did on their headstone, it says infantry, it says cannon master, it says cavalry, it says sharpshooter. They have it on their headstone because they wanted to send a message down through the generations that this freedom that we enjoy today was paid for with lives and blood and we must never forget that and we must honor those brothers that laid down their lives so that we could be a free people. So, the South is defeated. Du Bois writes a book called Black Reconstruction. How many of you have read that book? Black Reconstruction by W.E. Du Bois. He says, for a moment, we stood in the sunlight of democracy. Uh -huh. What happened with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment? Black men got the right to vote, and what did they do? They elected what was called, became known as the Reconstruction Governments. These were state legislatures, many of which were predominantly black. They were the state legislatures of the previous Confederate states. And do you know what these reconstruction governments did? Do you know what was one of the first things that they did? They created free public schools. The origin of free public education is down deep in the abolition of slavery and the freedom that our people attained after the Civil War. We gave this country free public education. And this is what, why we must fight, brothers and sisters. They want to destroy public education. They want to privatize these public schools. They want to set up a, another whole system in which the majority of our children will not be able to participate. We must fight for free public education. Keep our public schools public. Don't privatize our schools. Because I know it's, it's, hard for, it's hard for you to get this, right? And I know a lot of you feel, well, these schools are not as good. Let them take, let you have to pay for public schools. Then you'll understand what I'm talking about. Then you'll be mobilized and trying to get it back, but it's too late. You better hold on to it while you got it now. You better fight for it right now. Because if they take it away, it's going to be hard to get back. So brothers and sisters, by 1877, Reconstruction comes to an end. And it was one of those Bush Gore moments, you know? <laughs> Where one person had the electoral votes, and one person had the popular votes. And they made a deal, they said, all right, you can have the White House if you take the federal troops out the South, because see, See, you got to grasp this. It took force of arms to end slavery. I mean, we talk about the ancestors, the ancestors, the ancestors. Let's talk about what the ancestors had to do. The ancestors was fighting to get loose. The ancestors wasn't standing around. 
The ancestors from the beginning, we were fighting from the beginning. We fought against the slavers in Africa. We fought on the slave ships. And we fought here in the United States. And while we remember people like Frederick Douglass and Harry Tubman, we also should remember people like Nat Turner and Denmark Vesey, who stood up and used force of arms. Don't teach me about the American Revolution. And it was right for the American colonists to pick up arms against their British oppressors. If it was good for the American colonists, it's good for us, brothers and sisters. We need to celebrate those brothers and sisters that led slave rebellion. And so Reconstruction comes to an end, and we are literally re-enslaved. They call it Jim Crow, but it's really re-enslaved. It's just, it's just slavery by another name. Slavery by another name. And so Carter Woodson, people say, well, you know, they cheated us. They gave us February. Well, first of all, they didn't give us a damn thing. We chose February. Carter Woodson chose the week in February. And what week did he chose? He chose the week of Frederick Douglass' birthday and Lincoln's birthday. What's Frederick Douglass' birthday? February 14th, Valentine's Day. That is the birthday to Frederick Douglass. That is the date that he chose as his birthday because he himself really didn't know his real birthday. This was the condition of many of our people. They chose their birthdays. And so Negro History Week started, and it came out of a practice that people had. At the turn of the century, Carter G. Woodson comes home, and what does he do? He writes columns for the black newspapers about our history. Now, a lot of our people couldn't read, so what did they do? They took Carter Woodson's columns to church, and when church service was over, people would stay back and the one who could read would stand up in the congregation and read Carter Woodson's column to the people. And out of this practice, this weekly practice, came this week of celebration, Negro History Week, came Negro History Month. And you know what we went through. We went through, we were Africans when we got here, then we was colored, then we was Negro, then finally we discovered we black. Today we're African Americans. So Black History Month follows that. It was Negro History Month. By the 1970s, it's Black History Month, and many of us say African History Month and African American History Month today. But it is important for us to know that history, brothers and sisters. Our history is a history of struggle. You know, if black history is just a list of important dates, if black history is just a list of black people that invented things, and I'm not, I'm not using saying that pejoratively, God bless our brothers and sisters who have the genius to invent things. But if you only focus on important personalities, important dates, and important things we invented, you miss the whole purpose of black history. The whole purpose of history is to give you the trajectory, the historical trajectory of our people and the lessons that we have drawn from our historical experience. And Frederick Douglass sums up our historical experience the best when he says, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. No one gave us anything. Anything that we have of value today, we had to fight for. And we should be proud of those who stood up and who fought so that we could enjoy what few benefits we have today. This year, 2014, marks the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act. The two great achievements of the struggle against Jim Crow, well, there were many achievements but two of the many achievements of the Civil Rights Movement were the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, two things about this. This year is the 50th anniversary of the, of the Civil Rights Act, but also this year is the year that the Voting Rights Act will come up for renewal. 
And all of us need to be in on that because I heard somebody that was up here earlier talking about voting rights, unless I was wrong. Do you see what's going on today in America? They are passing all of these laws, once again, trying to suppress our ability to vote. Because what happened when we got the right to vote? We elected Reconstruction governments. We established the Freedmen's Bureau. We established free public education, other public institutions. That had to go. Then we got the Voting Rights Act passed. In 1966, there were 465 black elected officials in America. By 1972, there were over 10,000. And then these people, the descendants of their former slaves, get together and send a person of African descent to the White House in 2008. We should be proud of that, brothers and sisters. And not only that, getting reelected in 2012. Regardless of what you think, regardless of what you think about Obama's policies, the fact that we can, you ask somebody, you ask some people around here to be truthful. You ask them if in 2007 they thought a black man was going to be elected president. You ask them if they thought a black man with an African name was going to be elected president. I didn't even think it was going to happen. But we caught on fight. And we lined up at the voting booth like people lined up in South Africa to elect Nelson Mandela. And in 2014, see, we can't just vote in the presidential election. We got to vote in every election. The reason we got to vote in every election, and the reason why you got Chris Christie in Trenton now, we came out in 2008, but we went back to sleep in 2009. You think it's not important? Christie killed the ARC project. The ARC project would have provided 30,000 jobs in this area, and many of them were labor jobs that people didn't have to have degrees to do. They needed folks to dig that tunnel. And Christie, one of the first things he did was kill the tunnel project. And that had a direct impact. I know some of y'all walk right here talking about politics don't affect me, politics ain't important. That's a whole lot of BS. Politics controls your life, brothers and sisters. The only reason you think it don't do anything to you or for you is because you don't know what it does for you. It's not because it doesn't, it's because you don't know. You don't know. If you understood how every political institution, every level of government has a major impact on your life and the lives of your children, and there's no reason why any black person that's a descendant of those who were enslaved in this country should not be at a voting booth every time election is called. You're the one that don't know. You think it that you don't know. And it's our responsibility to educate ourselves so we do know. Ignorance is one of the biggest weapons the oppressor has. Apathy is another one. Ignorance and apathy it will stay in your place. And I don't know about you, I don't want to stay in the place I'm at. I think I want to go up a few steps. See, history is not a TV program with episodes, with a beginning and a happy ending. History is a continuum. Our story has not yet ended. It never ended. It only ends in books. And this struggle goes on between the forces of progress and the forces of reaction. It's not like a baseball game or a basketball game. One side lose, everybody go home. No, the oppressor, when he loses, he has a meeting the next day. How can we turn the situation around? You know what I'm talking about. When Obama got elected, 
the next day the Republicans were having a meeting. How can we make his presidency a failed presidency? And some of us fell into the trap. We became complacent. We were so filled with joy about having did what we did in 08 that we didn't think about what we needed to do in 09. And what happened? They got control of Congress. And so effectively, even if Obama wanted to do, wanted to do some of those things that we would like him to do, he can't do it because he needs both houses of Congress to pass his legislation. So we got to vote in 14 and in 15 and again in 16. And you know, it's like sometimes, brothers and sisters, we got to make hard decisions. See, what's the difference between leadership and being popular? I don't know much about the Bible. I'm not a very religious person. I don't belong to a church, but I can read. And from time to time, I pick up that book and I read it. Now, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I need a help. I saw there was a minister in here earlier. Maybe the minister could help me. But see, in the Old Testament, there were kings and there were prophets. The kings did what was expedient for the nation. The prophets did what was right. Because you see, what's expedient may not always be right. And see, the king was popular. David was popular. You know David, the king of Israel. They sang songs about David. David went out and conquered the Philistines. David came back on the horse. They were going in front of David, said Saul killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. David was popular, but Samuel the prophet was not popular. John the Baptist was not popular. There were two kings. Israel was invaded. Two kings got together. And you know, whenever before they went into battle, they would consult the prophets. One of the kings said to the other king, let's go get Elisha to tell us what to do. The other king said, I'm not going to get Elijah. Elijah never has anything good to say. Sometimes we got to tell the truth even when the truth won't make us popular. Sometimes we got to tell the truth even when it might not be the thing the people who are closest to us want to hear. And that's the difference between being a child and being a man. Because when you're a child, you want to be loved by everybody. But when you're an adult, sometimes you're required to do what's right even when people don't like it. This is a hard thing. And this is where we are now. We have to tell some hard truths to each other at this stage of our struggle. Like one truth is that after the black power movement, and the black cultural arts movement, and the black political movement, and the election of black people to office, and the attainment of black people to levels of corporate CEOs, and the appointment of black judges, and the appointment of black prosecutors, and the election of black governors, and black senators, and a black person in the White House, that the majority of our people are still catching hell in the 21st century. See, some people just want to focus on the good, but not the bad. Our people are suffering, and we're in worse shape today than we were in 68 when Dr. King was assassinated. Here's another hard truth. 40 years after the Black Power Movement, some of us are still ashamed of being black. There's still black people running around here getting bleaching cream. Yes, sir. 
Still black people ready to fight if you call them black. Still us trying to make our hair bone straight. We don't even just straighten it. We want bone straight now. Some of us still, you know, when I was a kid, we used to get our mother's stocking caps and put the new Nile in our head. Remember new Nile? <laughs> and take our mother's stocking and cut it off and make a hat and pull that thing down. It was so tight. It used to lead a mark right across our forehead. Because we didn't want nappy hair. We didn't like ourselves. That's what Malcolm said, right? We hated ourselves. We hated the color of our skin. We hated the flatness of our nose, the thickness of our lips. Some of y'all still run around and tell your children, pull your lips in, because you don't want their regular lips to be shown. When I was a kid, they used to take us, they used to take clothes pin and put on our noses, because they didn't want our noses to be African noses. They wanted to be aquiline noses. And still, 40 years later, you can ride the bus Kids getting ready to fight, the first thing one will say to the other, you black so-and-so. Because we're still struggling with this issue of self-hatred. And we're still letting, you know, the other night I was in a meeting and people were lamenting the fact that we are so divided. Well, you know, it's true and it's not true. In one sense, we are pretty united. I mean, considering where we were and what we've done to get where we are today, it took a high level of unity to make that happen. But the fact of the matter is that there are divisions that we have to overcome. There are religious divisions among us. Muslims don't want to meet with Christians and Christians don't want to meet with Muslims. There are ideological differences among us. And the religious differences don't just, not just Muslim and Christian, the Pentecostal don't want to get with the Baptists, and the Baptists don't want to get with the Methodists. As you know, in the AMEs, it's going in a whole nother direction. We have to overcome whatever divides us because our history shows us that when we are united brothers and sisters, Nobody can stop us. When we are united, nobody can stop us. Nothing can stop us when we are united. Here's another truth. The enemy has peeped our whole car. Do you know that they openly speak of not renewing the Civil Rights Act? They openly speak of not renewing the Voting Rights Act. You know why? Because they sense and see our weakness. I know this is a painful thing to say, but after 40 years, of black history programs, this auditorium should be filled. It should be filled. They sense our weakness. You know like animals can sense when another animal is wounded and you see how the hyenas circle around an animal. The animal ain't he dead, he's not dead. But they sense his weakness. The hyenas circle around and the vultures are circling around because they know dinner is coming. We have to recover the strength that we had in the 60s. We have to recover that strength. And all these organizations that we are part of, we got to build these organizations up. I mean, the fact of the matter is that when they say that they are going to cut unemployment benefits, when so many of our people are unemployed, regardless of who calls the demonstration, thousands of us need to be there. 
when they say they're going to cut food stamps, when half of our people live in poverty and are dependent on food stamps, there should be thousands of people at the food stamp office demonstrating. When they say that they're going to cut Social Security, when so many of our senior citizens, that is absolutely the only income that they have, and a cut in Social Security could be the difference between them eating tuna fish and eating cat food, we should be demonstrating in the tens of thousands. They sense our weakness. When so many of our people are sick and they say they're going to close our hospital, we should be shutting the city down. No, you're not closing any hospitals in our community. But look how many hospitals that they've closed. And these are not just institutions for the sick. Many of these hospitals are the biggest employers in our community. In Orange, New Jersey, they closed Orange Memorial. It was the biggest employer in the town. In Plainfield, New Jersey, they closed Muhlenberg Hospital. It was the biggest employer in the town. They closed two hospitals, Columbus and St. James and North. Now they're talking about closing. They might even close University Hospital. When these things happen, we should be on the front lines. One of the reasons that we are in this shape today is because we have become complacent. We have become apathetic. We have become callous toward our brother and sister. We made the most progress in the 60s because we were literally making revolution in this country. You don't believe me? Do you know? People talk about the Newark Rebellion. Newark wasn't the only rebellion. Between 1960 and 1972, there were more than 1,000 urban uprisings in America. This is why they was coming, yeah, let's get the Civil Rights Act passed. The civil rights people were turning it upside down in the South, and we were turning it upside down in the North. We were in the streets. Do you see what people all over the world are doing today against governments that they are unhappy with? They are in the streets. And if we want change, we got to get back out in the streets in big numbers like we did in the 1960s. This is the challenge that we have been faced with for 40 years. This is the challenge. And my regret, what breaks my heart is that I feel like for 40 years I have not done what I should have done. My organization should have thousands of members by now. The NAACP should have millions of members by now. We should be mobilizing at a moment's notice. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if they thought that we could put on a regular basis, not just a million men in Washington, but millions of people on the streets of cities all across this nation, this bull crap would not be going on today. It would not be happening. It would not be happening. It's happening because they have grasped our weakness. So what does the time require of us? 
The time requires of us to systematically and scientifically build our organizations, make our organizations stronger, and then make our organizations work together with each other. Too many of us are motivated by the newspaper and TV coverage. Sometimes I wish there even wasn't no newspapers and television. We jockeying for position to get into the newspaper, jockeying to get on the television cameras, jealous about other people that get more coverage than we. That means nothing. Our people are suffering. Our children are dying. Our senior citizens are homeless. Our children are uneducated. Our young men are unemployed. Our young men are locked up in 1966. There were only 100,000 black men in federal prisons. 100,000. It was proportionately equal to our proportion of the population, 10 to 13 percent. It has increased tenfold in federal prisons alone. It's over a million. And it's not just men, it's women. And the state prisons are worse than the federal prisons. The state prisons are 70% New Jersey state prisons, 70% black and Latino. And do you know what this is, brothers and sisters? Jim Crow is too mild a term. This is not the new Jim Crow. This is a new form of slavery. This is the re-enslavement the re-enslavement of our people. In the, and you think that I, it is a metaphor? You think this is hyperbole? No, they got these prisoners making stuff for major corporations. You know what the biggest investment is on the stock market now? Prison construction. You know who's in it? Companies like American Express. They're privatizing all the prisons and making them profit-making institutions. And who are the generate, what's generating that profit? Slave labor. It's slave labor. There's no other name, what are you gonna call it, prison labor? <laughs> and mask what it really is? It's slave labor. This is the re-enslavement of our people. Modern day slavery, that's right. We got to fight, brothers and sisters. Now is the time for us to fight. If I had something else to tell you, I would tell you. I wish I could sing you a song that you would really like. I wish I could sing you a song that would make you happy and make you leave here on a cloud. But unfortunately, I'm not the one. So tell Jeffrey Dye, don't invite Larry Ham back here next year because he don't have anything good to say. He does not make us feel good. I didn't come here to make you feel good. I came here to give you a warning. I came here to give you a warning that if we don't get ourselves together, we are going to be on somebody's nickel. Here lay the late great black people of America that once existed. I'm ready to fight. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to fight. Our people have paid too much in lives in blood, in sacrifices, for us to let them take away all that they fought for. And there's some people in power right now, they want to, some of them want to take us back to Jim Crow, some of us want to take us back to slavery, if they could, if they could get away with it, and use the Bible to justify it. Y'all saw 12 years of slave, right? You remember when Epps, the slave master Epps, Epps was the mean slave master. The first scene's open. What is Epps doing? He's reading from the Bible. Servant, obey thy... He's reading from Paul, by the way. The apostle Paul. Servant, obey thy master. If you don't obey your master, you shall have many stripes. <laughs> and Epps adds his own editorial and says, 100, 150. I'm ready to fight. I'm looking for a thousand black people that are ready to fight. 
I'm looking for a thousand black people who, is, who, is, who have said enough is enough. I'm looking for a thousand black people who are ready to answer the call to action when the word is given. Because I promise you that the years ahead are going to be filled with catastrophe. They are going to be filled with catastrophe. And we need a unit of people who are ready to stand and fight back. A million of us went to Washington, the Million Man March. It was a great achievement, but now we need a million people who are ready to fight, not just go to Washington for a prayer meeting. And I was one of the organizers of the Million Man March. I was the Jersey coordinator. So I'm not saying this pejoratively here. I'm just telling it like I see it. We need to produce a million people in the cities where we live, not just in Washington, D.C. There's seven million people in New York City. Imagine if there was an organization that could mobilize a million of them at a moment's notice. All this foolishness would stop. It'd be like, come to, look, come to the table, please. <laughs> Let's talk this out. They're closing our schools. They're going to lay off a 1,000 teachers in Newark over three years. I didn't know they still had a 1,000 teachers, so that means there's going to be 10 teachers left in Newark. They're going to lay off a 1,000 teachers in three years. They're closing our schools. They're closing our hospitals. They're closing the, the, the post offices. They closed the factories. The factories are all going abroad. They're foreclosing on our homes. How much more do they have to close before we say we draw the line right here? So, I know, brothers and sisters, I, this is not the kind of celebratory advice that you might have wanted to have, but I see no other thing. I'm 60 years old. I got on this path at the age of 17 in 1971. And I've been on this path for 43 years. And in 43 years, I've seen the condition of my people deteriorate. And I tell you that this book says we only get three score and 10. So my, I might have 10 good ones left. And I tell you, I don't know about you, but I know that before my time is up, I want to leave here having struck a blow for freedom. I don't want to go out quietly. I don't want to go out being remembered as a nice guy. I don't want to go out having been loved by all, by my enemies, as well as my friend. No, I don't want to go out like that. I want to go out, and when I'm gone, I want my enemies to say, damn, I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> See, you want to go out, you want to be everybody's friend. I'm past being everybody's friend. I'm not running for office, and I won't run for office. I want to be with that band. I want to be with Nat Turner's people. I want to be with Denmark Vesey's people. I want to be with Sinke's people. I want to be with Tucson's people and Dessaline's people. That's the people I want to be with. I want to have struck a blow against those who have oppressed and continue to oppress my people. And that's what I want to do. And I hope, brothers and sisters, you will want to do the same thing. So I invite you, please join somebody's organization. Calvin Merritt is here from the NAACP. Join the NAACP. I heard there's a group called the Muscle Group. Join that. A group called the Brothers. Join that. Community Unity Leadership Council, join that, or join the People's Organization for Progress, but join something. Black Men's Group, I saw Brother Eddie Little here. Join something, but don't stop with your joining. 
we got to go out and get other people to join and make our organization strong for the fight ahead. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Before y'all leave, give him another hand, and I don't want y'all to leave. This young lady came all the way from Brooklyn. She was caught up in that traffic. Please give her at least 15, 10 or 15 minutes to speak. I want to bring on Keisha Forrester from the United African Movement.
me tell you, everything you do should be revolutionary. If you're in politics, be revolutionary. If you're in education, be revolutionary. If you're in the fashion industry, be revolutionary. Don't be afraid of that. Black is always back. Believe that. So I want you to do serious work. Get to planning. Join these organizations. And I'm telling you right now, right now, Brother Larry Ham gave us an insight, but the hammer has already fallen down. See, I read the New York Law Journal. There's a reason why that paper is $8 a day. So they don't want you to read it. I read Crane's Financial. We sent our chairman to a Crane's Financial meeting some years ago. It cost over $2,300 just to attend. They were talking about what you see going on right now. When we came out and told the people what was happening, nobody wanted to hear it. Now you have gentrification. You can't buy a home if you wanted one. They tricked you to go out into the suburbs while they slipped back into the cities. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. When I went to buy my home, and the realtor that I hired, I gave him a criteria. I'm not leaving Brooklyn, period. First couple of nights, he had me and my husband driving all over the place. I'm not living in Suffolk County. They can have that. Ask John White what happened in Suffolk County. I don't want that. I want to be right here in Brooklyn. He said, well, let me take you out to Cobble Hill. Hell no, put me in East New York, Brownsville, Brooklyn. I'm buying my home right there. We got to stop this foolishness when we get a couple of dollars and we get a, a few years of education. You want to be closer to the oppressor. That's sickness and that is madness. We have suffered from what Dr. Bobby E. Wright perfectly described as menticide. We have to fix that. You know more about what's going on with Kerry Washington and scandal than what Condoleezza Rice did for you. You're not paying attention. You're not reading political times. Don't just do it for yourselves. Make sure your children are reading it. Make your home a revolutionary front. I like to have barbecues. I bring the family over. You won't watch what I want to watch. You won't listen to what I want to listen to. So what I did was, I had a holiday party. Now I don't celebrate Christmas, because I'm already exed out. If you were African, you were already exed out. You don't need to celebrate that. But I had a holiday party, because I have family members who do celebrate. But when they came in the front door, I had hidden colors playing, mesmerized. Every relative, where can I get a copy? You don't have to. I bought some for you already. Take them as parting gifts. If you can spend two fifty on a pair of phone posits, you can buy ten copies of Hidden Colors and hand them out to your nieces and nephews. Invite them over. Invite them over. Have them listening and watching lectures from Dr. John Henry Clark. Make your home a revolutionary front. I'm one of the teachers at the Freedom Retreat for Boys and Girls, for the girls portion. We were, supposed to, we were supposed to have a one hour woman's conference. That one hour turned into six hours. It's all how you relate to them. How I speak to you in here is not how I go direct the wreck on the block. We gotta know how to switch it up. That's how you pull it in. But I'm challenging you all to get on the block this summer. It's going to be a hot summer. Trust me. Some of you in here, who owns a home in here? If you don't own a home, that's fine. But if you do own a home, it's easier for you. Why the hell you don't have registered shotgun and rifle permits? I go to these gun shows. It's packed with white folks. They got what you call a, a bullseye of our leaders for sale. I'm not telling you what I think, I'm telling you what I know. When you go to the rifle and shotgun offices, it's packed with white folks. They tell you this lie, well if you had a criminal record, 
You can't get a license for a rifle and a shotgun. That's a lie. That's why I roll with the baddest attorney on the planet, Alton H. Maddox. I understand how this law game go. When I got my license, I was the last person to go and the only female and the only African. When I got to the desk, it was a sister there. She winked at me. She said, you like my elimination process, huh? And I said, yeah, and I smiled. So I turned over my paperwork and she said, you're the first person who came to me today and everything is right and exact. Then I had a conversation with the sister who was doing the fingerprinting. And she said to me, can you tell me how to go about getting a rifle and shotgun permit? I said, sister, how long you been working here? She said, 15 years. See, we don't, we don't look to these type of things. You got these Reverend Hoopin' Hollers who tell you to turn your weapons in. Let me tell you something. Reorganize your thinking. If you got brothers and sisters on the block who like the gang bang, organize them correctly against the real enemy. See, I walk with Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad on my back. I went to South Carolina this past summer to retrace my family history. I found out that my mother's family is descendants from Sierra Leone. My father's family is indigenous Africans who come out of Asbury Park, New Jersey, before it was Asbury Park. Revolution is in my damn blood. It's in your blood. I want you to go home tonight Stand in your mirror, not to need no applause, stand in your mirror, look at yourself, and see your great-great-grandfather and grandmother and what the hell they had to go through. Internalize that. I don't lay down and fight. My mother always told me when she sent me outside, she said, if you get in something and you don't fight back, I'm going to kill you when you get home. Brother Larry here made it plain for you. Prison is big business. Unemployment rate among teenagers, 14 to 21, is over 90%. Not 50, 90%. Black men, 55%. Black women, 40%. You wanna lay down and take this? You better learn how to fight. See, that's why our babies look at us crazy. That's why they walking around sagging. Their mental is sagging. There are no parents anymore. I'm a mother. Mothers get weak for our babies. But you have to have balance. See, when I'm a little weak with my daughter, my husband stepped right in and said, uh-uh, that ain't gonna happen. Sisters, and I'm talking to the sisters right now, cut this nonsense out. Well, you don't want the father involved with their children. I met my husband when my daughter was a year old. Her biological father, her stepfather, and me are a united front. See, I don't care about how many dollars he gave me. My great-great-grandmother made sure she was all right. We got to stop this foolishness. What happened now, they've gotten our damn kitchen. See, the black woman was always the stronghold. Now, we real housewives of Atlanta. Every major primetime television show where a black woman is the leading star, she is a whore. Check. Mary Jane, Scandal, and Tika something on Have and Have Not. Now, you got to have your babies. Don't turn away from it. Educate them by it. Let them know what is right and what's wrong. Hip-hop ain't hip-hop no more. It's rap. Wrapped around y'all brains. Wrapped around everything. It's nonsense. Everybody is, I got mine, I'm, I'm popping, I'm doing this, I'm doing, you ain't doing nothing. You 
do whatever that white man who gave you that contract tells your black behind to do. You are cold, a house nigga, and you should be called as such. Don't put me in a room full of them. I don't have that kind of fear. When you ride public transportation here in Jersey, New York, or wherever it is you travel from tonight, and you see our babies out of line, let me tell you something. I'm not afraid to die now, later, or whenever. Because when I do leave here, I've done my best work. We scared. I don't want to say nothing. They talking crazy in front of you. You don't have to be disrespectful, but let them know, uh -uh, brother or sister, this is not right. You know, I pulled the sister over last week. I said, sister, I said, you are so pretty. And she started smiling. And I said, you know, you really shouldn't speak like that, young lady. I said, it makes you ugly. And you don't want to look ugly. You don't want to give anybody an excuse to look at you crazy. That mouth closed for the rest of her ride, at least in the dialogue in which she was speaking. Let's fix this. The solution is simple. Mainstream media won't let you hear a Larry Ham or Alton Maddox or Jeffrey Dodd or Professor Griff. See, the enemy is smart. They always switching up and changing while we sleep. I do my best work three and four o'clock in the morning. My husband will look over and say, you're not gonna go to sleep? Uh-uh. We gotta get like that again, sisters. See, when we fix it, the jig is up. You want good, upstanding men? Get yourself right. You know, brother Jeffrey Dodd, they'll tell you, when they used to try to step to a female, they had to be right and exact back in the days. Now you got these dudes who look like crap and they got four, five, six, seven women. What is wrong with your psyche? Let's fix this. Know who your neighbors are. First day I bought my house, I went up down the block. I know where they work. I know how many kids they got, what time they get home. We got to stop that. When I did something wrong, and if Larry Ham saw me when I was a kid, he, it was his duty to check me. And then tell my parents, and God helped me when I got home. See, now somebody will tell you something, you mind your business. My mind is my business. Your mind is my business. I wish Professor Griff could have come through so he can show you that a lot of these Disney characters start out as sexual organs. The drawings start out that way. Go, to, go check out some of his lectures on YouTube. All these hidden messages and you wonder why we can't stay focused. You know more about Raymond Felton getting locked up than you do about what Jeffrey Dye and Larry Ham is really doing here in Jersey. We get tricked by these firemen too. See, I'm a sailor. I'm a call a spade a spade. That's just how I roll. They put these firemen in front of you when it's a catastrophe. When Trayvon Martin was shot down in cold blood, they sent their firemen, Mr. Al Sharpton and Messy Jesse, to distract you. They don't have jobs. You know who they work for? I'm going to tell the truth. Because I follow the finances. It's all public record. Al Sharpton gets paid by the Madison Avenue Initiative to make sure business is not disturbed. Jesse Jackson is paid by the Wall Street Initiative to make sure business is not disturbed. Who suffered in Florida? Was business hurt? Was the politics hurt? You suffered, because they gave 
gave you Jordan Davis next. They gave you Alfred Wright next. They gave you Ricky your boy next. And we just lay down and take it? I had a sister tell me, well, how come you don't say that when black folks is killing black folks? Because let me make it plain for you. If I shot this sister with her pretty self, if I shot her and the cops catch me, I'm going down 25 to luck. That's the difference. That's the difference. So this summer, be involved. Hit the block. Go to these schools. You pay taxes. Parents should be up in Martin Luther King every day. I want to sit in the classroom. Yes, sir. If you had thousands of parents circle this school building, when something is wrong, all hell will break loose. Be revolutionary, brothers and sisters. I want to be the next generation to do things correct. I want to be the next generation. I want to be the Francois Macandal. I want to be the granny nannies. Try that in the Jewish community. Try doing what they're doing to us in the Jewish community. Try it in the Asian community. Try that. We just take it. We become immune to abuse. Menticide. Go on YouTube and look up the lecture of Dr. Bobby E. Wright. Study black on black violence in service of white domination by Dr. Amos Wilson. Everything on YouTube now, use it for your benefit. Let's fix this. If you see my daughter and she's out of line, I expect you to check her. Because if I see yours, I'm going to do it. If a sister is not in her right mind and children are parentless, the rest of us got to step in and do it. Know your neighbors. That's where it starts. This summer, make this summer the time you do real work. Don't let another Trayvon, Jordan Davis, Ricky, your boy, Ayanna Jones, Sean Bell and the like go on. Don't let another hospital go down. Don't let educational institutions close with no real answer. If they close, you open an African centered school. I love you. I thank you for staying. I thank you for being patient. You know, I'm glad I didn't commit homicide on the bus, I, my leg was going crazy. My husband's like, stop shaking that leg. But I was frustrated because I wanted to be here. I wanted to be here for you. Join people's progress. You can join United African Movement. Use your dollars. If you can't physically join, we need finances to make things happen. $10 a month, can you afford that? Sure you can. Don't buy no more Chinese food. You be out. Stay out of Death, Death King and the rest of them. That's another thing we gotta do. Get healthy, sisters. Start juicing more. You know, I can get up in the morning. My husband leave for work at six o'clock. I can get up in the morning and make him some juice. You can get up, make yourself some juice. All right. All right. I love you. I want you to be progressive. I want you to move forward. I want you to do the right thing. I want you to know where your enemies are. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black, power. Black nationalism. Black nationalism. Black nationalism. Let's do this. Now that's black history. Give her another hand. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Sorry we was delayed, but you got it just the same. God is moving. Thank you all. And don't forget, network on Facebook. Support candidates that's running if they're right, only if they're right. 
and make sure you all, please, everybody that's in this room, come to the council meeting March 4th, 6.45 p.m., 3.30 Passaic Street, so we can support our Karen Brown, Judge Karen Brown. Thank you.